Good day, everyone. My name is Louis Kruger. I'll be doing the CPD presentation today on the Poppy Act. Um, I am the Managing Director of Kruger Attorneys and Conveyances, Inc. I qualified as an estate agent in 2000 and have been very fortunate to be on both sides of the desk. Uh, my privilege today to be presenting again after having previously trained for the then EAAB in 2016-2017 where some of you might have attended some of my presentations. So today we're going to talk about Poppy, the uh, Protection of Personal Information Act, which regulates how personal information must be processed, handled, kept secure, etc. So Poppy was effective from the 1st of July 2021. We know that in 2020 we were given one year to comply with the requirements. That time was up, and from the 1st of July last year, everyone needed to be 100% compliant. So we're going to talk through the various aspects of the Act now. So first of all, Poppy is very strict and has substantial penalties, which is why you need to be 100% au fait with the, the content of the Act. Contravening Poppy's provisions can lead to fines and imprisonment. Um, again, Poppy allows individuals to institute civil claims, resulting in a potential further financial loss. My suggestion to you is it's not a terribly long act. Read it over and over, uh, over time, just so that you acquaint yourself. Today, I will be running through the most important aspects of the act, um, and hopefully that should answer many of the questions that you have, and I have tried to bring a real estate slant to each of the, the different provisions. So first of all, we need to understand the terminology that is used and the various words that are used throughout the Act. And we're going to chat a bit about some of these different terms and what they mean. So the first one is personal information. Now, personal information is any information that relates to a person's race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status, nationality, the ethnic or social origin, skin color, sexual orientation, age, physical or mental health, well-being, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, language, birth, education history, medical history, financial, criminal and employment history. And then finally, Anything that is identifiable by way of a number, a symbol, an email address, a physical address, telephone number, location information, we're very quick to pin drop and send locations to people uh, on, on social media. That is all classified as personal information. So again, we've spoken about what personal information is. So generally, it is any biometric information, personal opinions, views or preferences, a view or opinion that someone holds about somebody else. And then, of course, correspondence, which was sent specifically to one person that is private or confidential in nature. Um, and particularly where correspondence later on would reveal what was contained in the original correspondence. So. Be very careful when forwarding emails. We tend to form our email threads, which have long conversations over multiple weeks or months or even years. And we take that and we hit the forward button and we send it on. Be mindful that there may be personal information contained in that email that you are just forwarding on. So personal information, again, is also the name of a person if it appears with other personal information. So just having Louis itself wouldn't be a problem because there could be many Louis. However, if you put Louis Kruger from Kruger Inc. Uh, conveyancer, it will be a lot easier for people to identify me and reveal information about myself. So yes, just a name might not be an issue by itself, but as soon as we add that to other information, and the information globally or together reveals information about a person that is then categorized also as personal information. We have another category, which is an unusual one, which is called special personal information. Now, we know Poppy covers 
all of this. So what is special personal information? A person's religious or philosophical beliefs, their race or ethnic origin, trade union membership, their political persuasion, their health, their sex life, criminal behavior, and then again, as I've mentioned, biometric information. So why do we have these two distinct categories? Well, simply because you may not process special personal information unless you've got consent. And children or information relating to children may not be processed without consent of a competent person being a parent, a guardian, um, or in some extreme cases, the master of the high court. So special, special personal information requires specific consent for you to be able to process that information. So what does processing mean? And again, the legislators here gave us a, a very conclusive and um, well-rounded definition. And it refers to any operation or activity or set of operations concerning personal information, whether or not by automated means. And it includes, and there's an entire list, collection, receipt, recording, organization, collation, storage. Um, it includes updating or modification, retrieval, alteration, consultation, dissemination. So you can see that every possible verb that could have been thought out to describe processing is included. It includes merging information, linking information, as well as restricting information, degrading it, erasing it, or destroying it. So every possible uh, verb, as I've said, relating to what you could possibly do with information is categorized under processing. So what do we process? We process a record, a record of personal information. So what is a record? A record is any writing on any material any information that is produced, anything that is recorded or stored on a tape recorder, computer equipment, or other device, any label, marking, map, book, plan, graph, drawing, or photograph, film, negative, a tape, or any other device which stores visual images. Again, you can see this is so broad that even writing a person's cell phone number down on a serviette in a restaurant could be classified as a record. So anything that is written down, recorded in any way, shape, or form is a record. And if what you've written down or recorded or stored or photographed or labeled or marked is personal information, anything relating to that whole list that we spoke about earlier, that is a record for the purposes of Poppy. We then deal with the responsible party, and that is a person or a body, a juristic body, who alone or in conjunction with others determines the purpose of and the means for processing personal information, for example, an employer. So, for example, if you're an agent with an agency, your agency and the agents would be responsible parties because you decide what information you're collecting from clients that you are recording, that you are processing, and you decide what you do with it, for what purpose, and how you're going to use it, etc. So a responsible party in the act is you as an agent, and then the agency which you represent. Automated means, as the name suggests, is where computers or technology take information and process it automatically without human intervention. One of the examples, for example, is you log on to NetFlorist, you order flowers, you don't see the little tick box that says save my details and automatically for months and years afterwards you receive special offers, congratulatory emails um, and, and various other marketing initiatives and that is literally because in an automated fashion your information has been included into some kind of database. So when does Poppy apply? Poppy applies to the processing We've spoken about processing. It's all those verbs of personal information entered into a record. What was a record? It was anything that was written down, photographed, stored by 
or for a responsible party. So even if you get someone else to assist you in obtaining that information, let's think about uh, cold callers, for example, someone in a marketing department, lead generation company, even though they are collecting the information for you and processing it, um, it's still for you, therefore, therefore Poppy is applicable, whether it's done automated or by non-automated means. Again, even if it's non-automated, if that information will now form part of some kind of filing system or is intended to form part of a filing system, a spreadsheet, uh, something stored in the cloud, whatever you do with that information, the minute that you process in any way whatsoever someone's personal information, it is then that Poppy applies. The responsible party must either be domiciled in South Africa or could be domiciled outside of South Africa, but make use of South African means to uh, collect and process that information. Now, the Act is very clear, and it's given us eight guidelines. They call them conditions for lawful processing. And that means if you stick to these eight conditions for lawful processing, you will be operating within the confines of the law. So the first one that we look at is something called purpose specification. And that is when we are going to collect a client's information, it must be for a lawful purpose and it must be related to a function or activity of the responsible party. And you must take the necessary steps so that your data subject, being your client, is aware of the purpose for which his personal information is being collected. So from a real estate perspective, it must be in line with what you are doing. Tell your clients why. Why do I need your information? What am I going to do with it? And then keep the information for only as long as you need it. And when you're done with it, destroy the information so that you no longer have to look after that information. The next one is process limitation. Again, quite a lot of overlap. Uh, between these different conditions, but you must lawfully use information only that is necessary. It must be adequate and relevant, not excessive for the purpose for which you are collecting it. For example, when you are getting a seller's details for a property or a buyer, there's certain information that is not relevant to what you're doing. If we think back at all the different classifications, uh, someone's criminal history, for example, or their um, trade union affiliation, their sexual orientation. None of that is relevant to the work that you are doing as a property practitioner. So why ask for information that you don't need? It's more information that you need to protect. So make sure what you're asking is lawful, is adequate, is relevant, is not excessive, is limited to your purpose, and that where necessary, you get consent. Your information quality. You need to take practical steps to ensure that your information is complete, accurate, not misleading, and updated where necessary. Taking into account all the time why you collected the information in the first place. So from a real estate perspective, make sure your information is complete, that it's accurate, not misleading, updated, and always remember the purpose. Accountability, really important. You are accountable to your clients and your clients are referred to in the act as data subjects. Those are homeowners, buyers, sellers, anyone involved in your process, be it a tenant, a landlord, a managing agent. Everything that you are dealing with that relates to a person or an entity is personal information. So from a real estate perspective, remember that your agency is accountable. They're the responsible party. Remember that agents or property practitioners have always been vicariously liable under the Act, and that is still alive and well. So an agent or a property practitioner who fails to adhere to the law could jeopardize even the agency that they represent. The agency and agent is in control of the information and everyone must have knowledge 
on the company's policy with regards to the collection, processing, safeguarding, destroying, etc., of personal information. Further processing limitation, this is really important. Where you receive information from a third party, um, we trust that they have the necessary consent to give you that information, but you cannot take that information and pass it on to somebody else. So I always use the example is if you've got a cousin who's an insurance broker, you can't take the information that you've gained from a client and pass it on to a family member who's an insurance broker so they can use that for lead generation. Use only information for the purpose for which it is intended and for what you obtained consent. Really, really important. And do not share the information with any third parties unless you've got consent from your client for you to be able to do that. Openness, transparency, I think is a really good word. Uh, it just really means that whatever we're doing with people's information, we must do so openly and transparently. And we need to tell people why we're doing it, what we're doing with it. And there's no kind of hidden agendas. So from a, a real estate perspective, be open and transparent. Explain to your clients what you're collecting, why you're collecting it, how you intend to use it. If you're not going to use it, how you're going to destroy it. And while you're using it, how are you going to protect it? Disclose, obviously, to your clients, too, whether some of the information that you're getting from them is voluntary or is mandatory. For example, FICA flows from the fi Financial Intelligence Center Act. There you have an uh, obligation, mandatory, to collect and confirm certain information. Tell your clients, this you have to give me because the law requires it. This I'm asking you because I believe this allows me to give you a better service. Security safeguards, really important as the name suggests. You are sitting with very personal, confidential information relating to your client. How are you going to take steps to prevent that information that personal information, that record that you've kept, that you are processing from being lost, damaged, or, heaven forbid, unauthorized access to that information. So how are you going to protect information given to you and in your control? One simple example that we always use is think about your own cell phone. How much information do you not have on your phone at any given moment that is personal information relating to clients? If you lose your cell phone, is that information readily accessible to somebody? Do you have a PIN code uh, on your phone? Is it got fingerprint or face recognition? Do you have the ability to wipe your phone remotely should you lose your phone so that your client's information is not uh, potentially falling into the hands of the wrong people. Data subject participation, as the name suggests, is the person whose information you're holding has the right to be part of this process. They have the right, free of charge, to come and look at the information you hold, how you're storing it, what you're doing with it, who you've passed it on to. Um, you have to make that available to them. So it's really important that you know where your information is, what you're doing with it, if you've shared it with a third party, who did you share it with, and did you have the necessary consent? We need to be completely, again, transparent, as it was suggested in one of the previous um, slides. A responsible party may be asked to correct or delete information which is in your possession, if it's inaccurate, irrelevant, excessive, misleading, or obtained unlawfully. So a client may come to you, a data subject as we call them, may come to you and say, please remove my record. And something we're quite familiar with is the term opt out. So when someone opts out, you need to delete their information. You're no longer allowed to keep it because they don't want you to. And then really important that you have mechanisms to delete and destroy information that you are no longer authorized to retain. So if the client gave you permission to keep their data for 12 months, 24 months, at the end of that period, that data should be deleted or destroyed. 
We have the information regulator who acts as a uh, big brother, uh, who is responsible for making sure that we all comply with poppy legislation. They will educate the public on poppy, monitor and enforce compliance, handle complaints and violations, attempt to resolve these complaints, and in time, we look forward to them issuing codes of conduct and guidelines. Really, if we think about it from a labor perspective, the information regulator will be acting very similarly to the CCMA, for example, in labor cases. They'll be there to educate and to monitor that everyone is sticking to the law and if there are complaints, they will deal with them. They will also be issuing those fines uh, and penalties that we spoke about earlier. So the question always is, how long do I retain personal information? And what's really important, I think, is a golden rule don't keep anything longer than what you need it for. There's no point having databases with thousands and thousands of records with information that may be outdated, that may not be accurate, because already then you are breaking some of those eight conditions of lawful processing already by, by virtue of having information that you really don't need. If you are supposed to keep the information for a longer period. For example, we know that FICA requires us to keep certain information for five years. Then you keep it for five years. But any information which is not obligatory or mandatory in terms of FICA, you only need to keep for as long as you really need it. Again, if there's no law or code of conduct prescribing, keep it reasonable and remember that at any stage, that data subject may come and ask you to have a look at their information. Again, remember, the minute you don't need the information anymore, take the steps to either destroy it or find a mechanism to re-identify your client. Get consent again, update the record, make sure that the information you hold complies with those eight categories um, or guidelines for lawful processing. Why should you comply with Poppy? Again, I say this in jest or as a joke, but prisons are not a great holiday destination and we all are commission earners. Really important that there are severe consequences to us not complying with Poppy. But there are advantages to complying, and that is what I want to share with you now, is Poppy promotes transparency with regards to information. So if we are open to our consumers, or our clients, we are likely to increase their customer confidence in our organization. They know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and we have no hidden agendas. So I think personally, when someone comes to me uh, and they're transparent about what they're doing and why they're doing, there's a confidence that is created in that person or in the organization that they represent. Because Poppy, Compliance revolves you capturing only the information that you need, the bare minimum, ensuring that it's accurate, removing what you no longer need. Your information is overall more reliable. Think about uh, in time past where we had massive databases, we sent out 10,000 emails and 9,000 of them bounced back. Why? Because the information was inaccurate, irrelevant, um, you know, no longer applicable, what Poppy seeks to do is to say, if you're going to hold information about people, hold only what you need, make sure it's accurate, and remove what is no longer necessary. Again, you must take the steps to protect the information. And if clients know that you are really looking after their data, they are more likely to give you consent to hold their data or to process their data is the correct terminology. Again, if you've got proper security safeguards in place, this will likely reduce your risk of any data breach and any public relation ramifications should any of that information be made public or leaked or be hacked um, and your company or you as an individual agent be drawn into uh, social media and newspaper articles for failing to protect clients' personal information. So we do get a few questions and I'll address them first. Direct marketing, 
is being governed by the Consumer Protection Act. In person, by electronic um, or email communications, that is direct marketing. Telephone calls are excluded uh, for this purpose. From the 1st of July, if you had existing clients in your database, I'm talking about the 1st of July 2021, anyone that was in your database already, you are entitled to communicate with them. You must, however, give them the option to opt out, right? So any database you had up to the 1st of July 2021, you can continue to market to those people, contact them. However, if they say to you, opt out, stop contacting me, you have to delete their record immediately. Any new clients that you obtain, so from the 1st of July 2021 onwards, they have to opt in. They have to agree to you processing their personal information, agree to you creating a record of their information. Really important, you need consent, obtain it. You have one bite at the cherry. So make sure that when you propose it to the client and you're communicating to the client, you explain to them properly what it is that you want from them, why you want it, that you will protect it, that you will not spam them. But remember, a no is a no. If a client says to you, I opt out, remove me, whether they are an old client or a new client, you have to adhere to their request. Poppy does not apply to non-electronic communication. In other words, phone calls, flyers, drops, etc. That is why cold calling is still very much alive and well and still being used by many property practitioners. Again, if the client says no or the client opts out, we have to remove their details from the database. Again, make sure that your source where you get information is legit and has permission to pass that information on to you. Really, really important. Okay, so what must we change? As property practitioners, know your forms. Form 1 is the objection to the processing of personal information that a client must complete to say, I don't want you to process my information anymore. They complete Form 1 and we have to adhere to it. Form two is request for correction or deletion of personal information. Again, as the name suggests, a form which the client completes that says, please correct my information or delete it. Form four gives us an application for direct marketing consent. Again, a format that you can use. Again, get consent. Your first approach to a client, you need consent, but you only need it once. Written consent is ideal because it's easier to prove if the client comes back to you later. Use the Form 4 if you're looking for a guideline on what the document should look like. Be clever about it. Include consent, poppy consent, into your mandates, offers to purchase. Any document that you get a client to sign, a listing document, a lease agreement, give yourself the consent in that document so that when you are processing the personal information at a later stage, the client can't object to it. And if they do, you can refer them to the relevant clause in those documents. So what are your steps from now on? You should have already done this. If you haven't, you need to do this without delay. Appoint an information officer in your company who will be responsible for overseeing your compliance of Poppy, your indoor policies, your documentation that you use, etc. Step two, evaluate the information being processed. Make a list, go through your documents, check your offers to purchases, your mandates, your leases, and ask yourself, do I need this information? Then compile your policies, procedures, processes, how you're going to collect information, how you're going to protect it, who's going to have access to it. Remember, at all times, those eight conditions for lawful processing that we spoke about. Then update your documents. Remove what you no longer need. If you were asking people uh, questions on their health, their sex life, their orientation, their trade union membership, their political persuasion, the whole kind of stuff that you didn't need, take it out. 
The less information you collect, the less you have to worry about protecting, the less you have to update and the less you have to keep relevant. And then really important is that you have a proper training process within your company and your organization so that everyone is kept up to date on training. I'd like to invite you at this point to visit our website at www.krugincorporated.co.za. We have a link on our website to a variety of webinars which you are more than welcome to watch um, in compliance with your non-verifiable CPD points and also to follow us on Facebook. We do interesting updates and tips of the week which you may find valuable. And just lastly, on our practice, we're a specialist conveyancing practice. We are unique in that we use an attorney-only approach. We do not use paralegals. So from the moment that we receive an instruction to registration, it is dealt with exclusively by a qualified attorney. We do real-time reporting, which is live on our website as we work on a matter. You are able to see the team actually processing a matter. We then send out weekly emails. We have offices in Randburg, Edenvale, Pretoria, Durban, and Cape Town, and very fortunate to be set up for remote working. So during any kind of lockdown or load shedding, the team is still able to work remotely, efficiently, um, and continue to service our clients. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.